All right, number six. One, two, three. Hmm. Hmm. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Just like number seven. Hmm. I, okay. Not bad. I ain't mad at these. <laughs> nah, me neither. Hmm. Hmm. You want to go first? All right. So for my number six, I have Dom's Dodge Charger Daytona. I think that, so this one was in Fast Six. six. So I don't have a ton of objective reasons for why this one is so badass. It's just one of those things that nobody has to say it, but you know what it is you know that there is something very special about this car um you know just the rich heritage that that it brings to the screen you know it left a lasting impression on me but i don't have a ton of reasons as to why it should be placed up this high other than the fact that hey it's badass yeah i i mean i can agree with that um i personally love the charger daytona like i've said off screen or off camera many times if there was going to be a charger iteration that i would own that would be the one yeah um not nah, solid pick it was hard for me to put this one together and for me if i'm gonna come at this first from a personal bias it's hard for me to put this r34 at number six because if it was a person more of a personal thing i would probably have it higher um but i have it at number six so from the franchise point of view, much like Hans RX-7, I think this is kind of where we see Brian come into his own. This was really the first time other than Too Fast, Too Furious where we saw a little bit more of a developed, mature Brian O'Connor. Yeah. Um, and then also the the race, the going through town with Dom and all the other racers, but of course it always has to, it has to end with Brian and Dom. And you actually see for the first time in the franchise, legitimately, Brian was gonna pull Dom. And Dom gives him the little love tap and spins him out, right? So like, I think that scene right there for the for the franchise also kind of establishes that kind of what kind of character Brian was gonna be from there on out, um, as far as like a precision driver or a running mate to Dom and, and things like that. Um, so that's how it re that's why I picked it in relation to the franchise. And then obviously just from a personal standpoint, I love Skylines, I love GTRs. I had to I had to have it. Same here, and I'm pretty sure that that everyone out there thinks that you know I'm a muscle car fanboy, which I am. But I have a lot of love for for the JDM imports too. And you can never go wrong with a Bayside Blue R34. Yeah, you know, just something about about how clean it is, you know, because because in Fast Four, we we really started to see how how the producers were starting to realize like, hey, um, you know, people in the street don't actually paint their cars in these crazy liveries with all these 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 elaborate stickers and designs. And so when they and so when they presented each, you know, a nice clean R thirty four like that. Yeah. You know, I mean like even you know, even up into into in today's standards, I would see this. I mean well obviously in California if we saw saw an R thirty four, everyone is stopping to look at it. But I feel like it's not a dated look. It it looks great. No, to me, in my personal opinion, one of the cleanest cars in the franchise. I agree. Hmm. All right, I'll give you that one. Okay. Yeah, I was gonna say R thirty four. I'm not about wrong. to argue with Godzilla. <laughs> All right, we're getting in a top five. This is what I uh, this is what I was really waiting for. It's starting to get real now. Yeah, I'm very curious from here on out to see what our what our lists are gonna be. I feel like once we're into the top five, this is like <laughs> judgments based on a person's character. <laughs> now you know this so. is top five for the franchise. Yeah. All right, ready? Yep. Three, two, one. Hmm. Uh -huh. <laughs> oh, I got this one. I, I'm very, okay. Wow, I would not have picked that in my top five. I got this one, homie. All right, so so shall I proceed? Sure. Okay, for my number five, I have Sean's RB26 swapped Mustang GT. So the reason why I have this as my number five is, is, is for a variety of reasons, okay. <laughs> the reason for a variety of reasons. No, I'm just shut up, Jordan. Stop trying to sound smart. No, I'm just thinking. Oh man, if his top, if his number five is an RB26 Mustang, I'm trying to put him together in my head with the rest of you. <laughs> <laughs> it's dope. All right, here's why. So this one is so cool because. At the time when this head came out, okay, this so, is totally a personal like decision right here. 
<laughs> Sorry, <laughs> just keep going. Just keep going. All right, look. Okay, <laughs> it's so you know the movie is happening. Sean, Sean, and Sean and DK are at the climax of the film, but Sean he doesn't have a car. And so, and so me as an audience member, I'm thinking, oh my God, how is he supposed to get his girlfriend back? Oh my God, how is he supposed well, to race against a triad guy? No, wait, I'm a Yakuza guy without, <laughs> without a car. He doesn't even have a car. He's a broke high school kid. Oh wait, his, his bum ass dad has a Mustang that's just sitting out there. And then he has a Nissan Silvia that he crashed earlier. What if we put this in that? And so this was so cool because this was when drifting was starting to get more and more steam behind it, especially in the mainstream's eyes. And so the producers capitalized perfectly by by doing a must well by doing an RB26 swap and dropping it into American Muscle. I love seeing that because a it pisses off all the American Muscle car guys when they when they saw this, they wanted to vomit. I'm sure. They did not like it, but a lot of people thought it was cool. And then after this happened, started to notice a real trend of this happening more and more often of people doing doing Japanese swaps into American Russell and then vice versa with Japanese cars starting to embrace, you know, all of the LS swaps and and everything like that. So I think that I kind of think that this was was the writing on the wall for what we're seeing more and more today all valid points i would say Mm -hmm. however when i put together my top five that's when the true significance and impact to the franchise was taken into consideration for me for the the rb26 swap mustang i can see where it influenced or had its impact on car culture car community and a little bit less on the franchise. That's why I'm so. Hmm. That's why I'm so shocked. Yeah. Yeah. So for me, I had to go number five with Brian's Mitsubishi Eclipse because that's the first car that you're really introduced to as Brian's, you know, first street race car. That's the first street race that he did, and your introduce your introduction to Dom and the rest of the team. And I mean, you have like the iconic scene where he rescues Dom from the police chase and, and things like that. I think it was just a very defining moment for what Fast and Furious is. And when you think about Fast and Furious just in general, you can't not talk about the Green Eclipse, despite how we personally feel about it, because mm-hmm. Lord knows it's not my personal <laughs> favorite car. No. I would be choosing that personally. <laughs> Any day of the week. Exactly. But I just think when you're thinking about Fast and Furious, you can't not talk about the Green Eclipse. I definitely agree. I definitely agree. But, you know, I think that one of my criteria for judging this was, you know, not just the impact on the franchise, but also on, also the impact on culture sure. overall too, you know, yeah. and 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 like you know how many you know how many of these professional well drift car guys and Formula D and all and all of these other their types of organizations have have gotten the idea because they were inspired by this final scene in Tokyo. Drift. Well, I'll, I'll present this to you. That engine swap, yes, I personally love it to your point also because it might piss off some true American fanboys and, and things like that. And it is very modern with the times. But I will say with the introduction of the first Fast and Furious movie and what kind of gave street racing and car culture its, you know, its history, this I think is what comes to mind. So without this, that I don't know is you know mm-hmm. would exist or be at the level to where it is today. That's my counter argument. But if you're asking me personally, I would choose I would choose that Mustang. <laughs> <laughs> I get what you're saying. <laughs> this is top five, dude. This is top five. I don't know that I can have the Mustang in my in my top five. You will, well, you don't even have it in your top 10, apparently. <laughs> it's not in my top 10. Wow. <laughs> Man. <sighs> we, can, we can rank this in order uh, as we put together our top five. I think this one can go unsettled right now. That was just my justification for, for the eclipse. Okay. All right. Number four. Three, two, one. Hmm. 
I, wow. Okay. You're surprised that that I have this that that low, huh? <laughs> Out of my top five, huh? No, I'm surprised you have it that high in your top ten list. <laughs> are, are you really? I, I am. <laughs> Uh, all right, since you went first in the last couple of justifications, I'll go first on this one. Uh, I think the White Supra, Brian's White Supra and Fury 7 really doesn't need much explanation. I think from a personal and a significance and an impact on the franchise, we all know how we were feeling when we went to go watch Fury 7. We all remember that last scene where he drives off, you know, so just from a impact standpoint, that and the entire Fast and Furious franchise, that has to be one of the top scenes, memorable top scenes, uh, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. And the fact that it was Paul Walker's original Supra, uh, I don't think you can beat that. And then from a personal standpoint, a clean JDM Supra on, I think they were BBS wheels, and I have one. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to do this anymore. <laughs> <laughs> That's why I had to go with uh, with Brian's white white Supra. The Ice Charger. I have this one placed so high at my number four because I feel like this is the most outlandish, ridiculous contraption ever conceived by by the mad scientist who goes by the name of Dennis McCarthy. Definitely. Uh, you know. And it's significant to me because for me, like, you know, so when I started here, here at Jada about almost two years ago, one, one of the first shows that, that I went to, we actually featured the ice charger at our booth mm -hmm. and, and, and for you guys, which you guys had seen it, well, multiple times prior. And so, and so, but you're used to it. Me, I had just seen the movie a year prior. Mm -hmm. I'm working here and now I'm standing five feet away from, from this thing. And I just saw the meaty tires, the crazy body work. I learned learned some of the facts of what went into making this car. You know, um, they and so they cut one charger in half. I think that and don't quote me, but they got the front half of a 70 charger. They got the rear end of a 69 charger, I believe. 68. 68 charger. Think, yeah. <laughs> Sandwiched them them together. Oh, and then they made it all wheel drive. And uh, hey, uh, hey, uh. Oh, he's gonna do it. Oh, oh, oh <laughs> I'm going there. If you didn't know this, but uh, it's also in. It's an LS swap. <laughs> Mopar guys are, are throwing their beers at the wall right now, <laughs> screaming at their wives in the Applebee's parking lot. <laughs> no offense. I love Mopar guys. Don't worry. But, um, you know, so just and then again, from from what I said earlier of how it represents where this franchise is going, mm -hmm. of how they're always trying to ante up and how you said said um in fast seven with the off-road challenger yeah. that was their way way of starting to ante up on on dom's chargers this is the ultimate ante up right here totally i would agree with that yeah yeah this is gonna be a hard top five it's gonna be a hard one 